So hello everyone, I hope you enjoyed the movie yesterday, if uh, you saw it, and had a good night of sleep. So uh, yesterday the first talk was about tobacco, now we have another traditional psychoactive on the spot. So it's called um, ayahuasca and analogs effect on the relationship to oneself and others. So we will discover how this substance uh, can enhance uh, empathy, prosociality, and improve everyday life condition of patients suffering from mood disorder and addiction. We will also have a look uh, at this analogs effect. Our speaker is an experimented therapist with experience in the effect of psychedelic and meditation. She's also a researcher, uh, now working on her PhD in the University of Zurich um, on neuropsychological and subjective effect on therapy relevant process of ayahuasca and its analog. Besides that, she has a like dancing and the mountain. Please welcome to Elena Aisha. Thanks for the introduction, including the mountains and the dancing. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about ayahuasca and analogs um, and the effects on relationships uh, in everyday life. Uh, how does this work? Uh, oh no. <laughs> Can the, the, the red? The, the uh -huh. green one? Yeah. Oh, okay. Maybe to start with, I would like to uh, share my conflicts of interest. Uh, my funding comes from the Swiss National Science Foundation and the um, Center for Neuroscience in Zurich. Um, I'm a member of the SEPT and also of the ISSP and of the MIND. And not officially, but really closely a uh, friend with Reconnect Labs, who produces or um, this ayahuasca analogs that I'm going to talk about. So I don't officially have conflicts of interest, but certainly uh, it's a topic of allegiance that I think it's important what we do, uh, including um, taking care of the risks. Um, what we're going to see today is a little bit of background on ayahuasca. So what is ayahuasca? I think we really had a nice introduction yesterday. I appreciated the talk in the morning uh, very much. Um, I will talk a little bit about globalization, uh, context, safety, uh, some dilemmas that we are facing, and then also um, how um, the current mental health crisis meets these findings that we have from studies uh, with ayahuasca on mental health. And we know that mental health is closely related to relationships. Uh, so people are suffering, for example, from depression, um, have often impaired relationship to themselves and also to others and the world in general. So I will uh, present to you two studies. One is a global ayahuasca survey, an observational study, um, where we will see um, how participants perceive ayahuasca use has effects on their everyday life relationships. And then from there, I'm going to also talk about a study, an intervention study we did with ayahuasca analogs, uh, effects on empathy and prosociality and self-compassion. So we heard yesterday ayahuasca is an ethno-medicine coming from the Amazon region. Um, and it has been used in, and is still used in rituals and for medicinal purpose in these regions by the indigenous people. And it has a capacity to induce altered state of states of consciousness, as you are aware of. Like this, this is Shipibo artwork. It's about their language, their uh, ikaros, their singing. They express also the experience they have with ayahuasca. Um, in terms of botanical origin, um, there's this um, uh, ayahuasca wine that's always included in ayahuasca. And as we heard yesterday, often there are additional plants um, like chakruna or chakrupanga, but it's not always the case, and all the uh, tribes have their own recipes. And these plants are cooked together for days and it's included in a ritual. Uh, Pharmacologically, um, the ayahuasca wine, Vanisteriopsis carpi, contains beta-carbolines. They are reversible monoamino oxidase inhibitors, and these prevent the DMT that's contained in the other plants 
from degradation in the gut. Um, so the DMT can reach the brain, and there it has agonistic properties at several receptors. And uh, the most prominent or most well-known is the serotonin 2A receptor, uh, which is also known to induce these hallucinogenic effects. I'd like to talk a little bit about globalization. Um, so we know uh, indigenous tribes are using and have been using ayahuasca uh, for a long time. Um, then in the 1930s, it was adopted by uh, the churches in Brazil, like UDV, Unidao de Vegetal, or also Santo Daime, Barquina, to name a few. Um, so it's almost uh, 100 years ago. In the 80s, it became more popular around the globe. And we also uh, witness an increase in um, sham uh, shamanistic or uh, neo-shamanistic ceremonies all over the world uh, in Western countries. And vice versa, uh, Western people uh, go to the Amazon to experience the real traditional um, uh, ceremonies that they uh, wish to find there. Uh, ayahuasca has also been recognized uh, by uh, culture, uh, music, uh, film. Uh, it has been shown in the media, and there's an increasing body of research on the topic from very different angles interdisciplinary. Uh, regarding safety, there are uh, different perspectives uh, to talk about, um, like long-term studies with ayahuasca in, um, in church settings, so in very structured settings, have shown only minimal risks, and um, <coughs> adverse events often only transient, and no potential for dependency has been uh, identified. But there are certainly risks uh, regarding the setting or situational safety. Um, <clears throat> where do the participants come from? What's their preconditions? Uh, how is the support provided? Um, so um, screening of mental health and physical health is an important issue. Um, we also heard about that yesterday in the tobacco talk. Um, I think it's important to notice that these traditional settings provide um, a lot of structure and safety. Um, so there's not a lot of variation that could increase the risk. So this um, like well-managed care and setting uh, uh, contribute to the minimizing of risks. And this is also a bit similar for ayahuasca churches. They have very like strict or um, well-controlled uh, settings, which also minimizes the risks. And we can say that nowadays, uh, with the neo-shamanic um, traditions, or also there in South America in the touristic centers, there's uh, a much higher variability of these settings, which could potentially increase the risks. Then on a political or collective level, uh, we also heard about that yesterday. Um, this globalization also leads to a potential risks for the indigenous people um, because there is this risk of prohibition, um, not because of what they do, but, for example, because of what we do with their coca leaves here in the Western world and criminalization. And um, also something to address the endangering of it, indigenous traditions. So that's one part. And, uh, some complementary thoughts on that. I think it's equally important to also notice that there's a risk in um, something we call cultural pessimism, that people in the West kind of um, reject their own tradition and idealize the other tradition. Uh, so already traveling to this very different uh, cultural context is quite a, a process, and this can also lead to difficulties in terms of psycho-spiritual integration and understanding the own psychological process while still respecting the other uh, tradition or worldview. I think that are issues that need to be raised or thought of. Now, we were interested in this globalization. Why do people drink ayahuasca? What does motivate them? Uh, in which settings do they do it? Wh which are the risks and benefits they as associate with? So we set up the survey uh, in 2016 with an international team in um, the, the founder is based in Australia, Daniel Perkins, um, but we also collaborate with Brazil, uh, Spain, Czech Republic, Germany, Switzerland. 
Um, and we did the survey, it's closed now, thanks for taking uh, pictures, but uh, you can't uh, participate anymore. Um, one, um, one finding of this survey was effects on uh, mental health. So of the participants that uh, reported that they have had depression or anxiety before, um, most of these people reported that their symptoms had improved uh, after drinking ayahuasca. It's really a majority. I think it's still important to look at those that did not profit, what's going on with them, what were the reasons, maybe also contextual, but you can see the majority seems to have profited. And that's certainly only uh, one contribution with a, a selection bias sample, but there are also randomized controlled trials uh, showing um, effects of ayahuasca on depression severity, but also reduction in suicidality. And just this year, uh, a study came out investigating um, in an observational trial um, ayahuasca analogs, and they also found that depression was reduced after the ceremonies. Now, overall, we see that there's this increasing body of evidence showing uh, potentially therapeutic effects of ayahuasca uh, in the treatment of uh, mood disorders, uh, depression, PTSD, anxiety, eating disorders as well, and also drug dependency. Now, this is even more important. Oh, that's also important. Um, I think it's uh, interesting that the need for psychological support seems to be widely accepted, so the importance of the setting and facilitation. I think that's even more important as we are living in a world with, um, with a, a lot of suffering. So depression, anxiety, and all these stress-related mood disorders are a leading cause of disability worldwide. Uh, so they are uh, a burden for every individual human being suffering from these conditions and also on a collective level. And we know that um, depression and all these um, disorders are usually also affecting relationships and vice versa. So people with depression usually report impaired relationships and connection to themselves, to others, and also to nature. And there was this beautiful paper by um, Rosalind Watts and colleagues where they found from participants of uh, clinical trials with um, psilocybin that participants reported this sense of connectedness as one of the key mechanisms uh, that they associated the healing properties with. So that's why I was interested in ayahuasca and relationships, um, how does that interact, or what, what can we find there? And to give you an idea, um, a very preliminary idea, I will show you just uh, a, a work cloud that I did out of the qualitative reports of our participants in the AYA survey. And you see that relationships, love, connection are words that are mentioned very often. So I think this word cloud gives a kind of a net an atmosphere of what people reported. But that's very unstructured, uh, so I'm going to proceed um, with some data that um, we asked them about uh, specific life changes regarding relationships, uh, relationships with others, but also with nature and society. And uh, you find here, like at the left side, we ask for uh, intimate relationships ending and starting healing or creating uh, conflicts, and then also deciding to have children or deciding to not have children, and also um, engagement with uh, social and environmental causes. And you see in blue the percentage of people that reported um, these life changes. So these are the life changes, but then we also wanted to know how did people evaluate these changes. And you see here that some people evaluated them as negative, but only overall uh, only few. And most people evaluated those changes as being very positive or, or positive. So good so far, but then these are numbers. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, it gives us a general understanding. 
But then there are something, some things that uh, made us curious. For example, people reported creating rifts, and they evaluated them as these life changes as positive. So this made us uh, think what was going on with these people. And uh, then we looked at the qualitative reports of these participants. And I'm going to read some of them. Uh, so one participant, for example, uh, he wrote, I've had a huge conflict with my mother because we needed to root up old traumas. And that was a sensitive, scary time, but now are sorting things out and we have a much better and truthful connection than ever. Another participant wrote, the creation of new conflicts in relationships has been an excellent teacher for me, especially in the realms of learning about self-worth, personal boundaries, and that conflict can be okay and healing in its own well. It has been resolved now, but the lessons for both of us were profound. And the last one, the change ayahuasca caused in me was something my family didn't understand, and they still held on to the old perceptions of who I, I was to them. This caused a lot of pain and fighting within my uh, family dynamics, but has been an important lesson in growth and following my own heart and being true to myself as an individual. I found that touching reading through all these reports, uh, I, yeah. Now, uh, another thing we did was um, like showing them life domains uh, related to relationships to other people, but also to oneself. Maybe one note uh, regarding that. Um, it's clear that these always interrelate and this distinction between relationship to others and to oneself is somewhat artificial, for example. Sexuality, of course, it has something to do with me, but it also is in relation to others. But for the sake of uh, yeah, simplicity, I'm going to make this, like, this distinction. And we asked the participants um, how they felt that the ayahuasca use had affected these life domains. And we see that overall this was a rather positive, um, so relationship with others, uh, other family and friends, intimate relationships, uh, then also um, emotional well-being, uh, life direction, sense of purpose, and this post-traumatic growth questionnaire that's uh, sort of uh, related to the <coughs> relationship to oneself. I think the feeling comfortable and confident with their own sexuality is an interesting uh, thing because it sh doesn't really share the same pattern with the other domains, it seems to be more on the neutral side, so there's something going on um, that's maybe a bit more complicated. Now you might, might say this is a very biased sample. People that participate um, in this survey, they anyways um, want to continue and they are um, positive about ayahuasca. So we had a bit a uh, closer look which contextual and um, experiential factors modulated these effects. And you see here <coughs> at the left side, for example, the spiritual dimension of the ayahuasca experiences and also the insights psychologically that people had was positively influencing relationships. And <coughs> also religious settings played a role, a positive role, and the community. So if people reported drinking ayahuasca in a close community, and also regularity of use. On the other hand, we see that if participants had extreme fear during uh, ayahuasca sessions or integration difficulties after the sessions, that was a still um, higher effect even than the fear, or um, the younger they were, the less did they profit from the ayahuasca use. So they still reported positive effects, but it was modulated downwards or upwards. And again, sexuality seems to fall a little bit out of that pattern, so we only find um, associations with the experiential dimensions. Um, I didn't include uh, gender and some other uh, factors. Uh, that's also like um, maybe too much for that talk, but uh, we're writing on that now. Um, I can highly recommend the, at, at the right side uh, the work that we were presented yesterday from Re Leo Roseman, 
on um, Hannes Kettner um, was the first author on communitas, so that um, uh, yeah, participants and this shared experience uh, was positive for the long-term well-being and feeling of social connectedness. Now again, <coughs> you might think, okay, these are only participants that uh, uh, anyways are positive about ayahuasca, so what we did was uh, looking at the subgroups of people that said, I will drink ayahuasca again, versus people that said, I will not drink ayahuasca anymore. And indeed, we find differences in all of these dimensions. So wherever something positively influences relationships, people that don't continue have lower values. Wherever something negatively modulates uh, relationships, uh, people that don't continue have higher values. And also they report generally lower effects on relationships in everyday life. But was, what was interesting to me was that they still reported positive effects. So the people that don't want to continue, they still reported that in, on average they profited in regards to relationships in everyday life. So that's for me interesting. And I'm going to look also at some qualitative reports if I find something on that. Um, yeah, something that I was also interested in was this religious setting. Um, why does a religious setting um, um, positively benefit or um, modulate the, the um, relationship between ayahuasca consumption and relationships in everyday life? And we did a mediation analysis and found that the effect uh, on, on the, of the um, religious setting is still there, but it's at least partially mediated by the regularity of use and also the community. So people that drink uh, ayahuasca in the, in the church communities, um, they go there regularly, they see their people, they have a close community uh, which uh, provides a container uh, of safety. Um, so they profit from these communities. The regularity I find also interesting because we had uh, some uh, publications or there were some publications on like single uses of psilocybin or ayahuasca that changes, um, for example, symptoms, severity of depression. And it seems that there are some benefits of regular use because of this community feeling partially, but also just in general of this regularity. Um, we had that bird of attention yesterday in the talk by uh, Federico, so I would like to just give you some quotes of our participants that you might just uh, read and let it sink in for a moment. So these are very rather positive uh, reports. I think that's the majority. Still, I would like to also balance this a little bit out and also talk about those people that um, suffered or that had problems with their experiences. Some wrote, for example, that it added confusion or even devastation. And uh, someone reported that he's going through another conflict with whom can I openly talk about my experiences without being stigmatized? So this is still an issue. Um, someone summarized this um, positive-negative evaluation nicely, and he wrote, or she wrote, that I understand the need to have short, simple answers in a study like this, but do remember that many changes are neither positive or negative and do not need to have value judgments placed on them. Uh, 
And to summarize this all, another quote, this is a very complex soul journey. So where are we in this journey? We have seen a bit of background on ayahuasca, the current mental health uh, issue and how ayahuasca meets this um, situation. And we have seen some insights from the Global Ayahuasca Survey. And now I'm going to go into the intervention study. Um, yesterday in the panel, I told you about the media headlines when we did this study with Franz Vollenweider with uh, psilocybin and meditation a few years ago, which said uh, the university is uh, uh, organizing drug camps. Nowadays, this looks very different. Um, the media uh, reports or headlines are a bit more open or positive. And uh, this con contrast of uh, the headline with a, a picture I would like to take as a motivation to talk about some dilemmas. Um, like um, ayahuasca is coming from a very different world, uh, very different so, um, context and culture. And if we do this work here, um, we ultimately, or we um, without, like it's not possible to um, do that without running into some dilemma. Um, one thing is that we call it ayahuasca analog because we. Um, we do that from a pharmacological perspective. We are inspired by the ayahuasca, and we uh, try to somehow implement it or uh, study it in a Western context. So we are taking uh, molecules out of their brew. Uh, so that's a very pharmacological perspective of uh, analogs. Uh, but I th think we still use this word uh, because we also want to um, appreciate the motivation or the inspiration where it comes from. So if we would do as if the inspiration did not come from the ayahuasca, um, then we would maybe also not acknowledge where it comes from. And we're aware that from, uh, from the traditions and from the, the culture where ayahuasca is coming from, what we do here is not an analog because the whole context and cultural surrounding um, goes into the ayahuasca. So what we do here is something very different. We didn't decide on how to name that yet, uh, but we think it's um, also an ethical dilemma if we have people suffering here in the Western world and we know that there are um, medicines that can help them. For us, it would also be unethical not to try to implement it here in a culturally appropriate setting. So that's a dilemma we can't solve. Uh, maybe we will never solve it. We will have to live with it, maybe. Um, Yes. So, you um, knew about or you have heard about uh, the plants that contribute to the ayahuasca. It's always Banister riopsis copies and most often um, other plants involved. So what we do is taking plants from the European uh, regions, also out of ecological reasons. Uh, in our case, it was Peganum harmala and Mimosa hostilis. Um, so already there we have not, uh, we have something else, something different. While um, indigenous people brew the ayahuasca brew over um, a long time, we also take a long time, but it looks a little bit different in our case. Uh, um, while in ayahuasca there's a variety of ingredients uh, and different mole uh, molecules in there um, pl from the pharmacological perspective, um, in our case, we decided to go simple also because of the uh, simplicity um, that we need for the studies. And we decided to go for DMT and harmine for several reasons. While this was in the picture on the newspapers, it looks a bit different in our case. So we had these rooms in the basement of the university building, the sleep labs, and we tried to make them as nicely as possible um, and comfortable, but it's certainly a Western context. So what we did there in these rooms was, um, on the one hand, an open-label dose-finding study uh, with 10 participants, and then we went into a randomized controlled trials with three conditions, DMT and harmine, and also harmine alone and placebo. We had uh, 
31 participants. It was all uh, healthy male uh, subjects. We will talk <laughs> maybe about the male uh, gender bias, um, but for the pharmacologic um, studies, the blood levels and uh, like with the hormone cycle, that's often the first step that you go into a uh, healthy male. Um, we measured uh, potentially therapy-relevant um, processes with different methods, physiological, like blood, as I said, uh, ECG and EEG, and also tasks, psychological tasks and uh, psychometry. And we also did qualitative interviews uh, and made transcripts out of them. To give you a very brief um, like feeling of what participants reported, uh, you see here the 11 dimension altered states of consciousness scale. Um, for our sample, you see that we had this elementary imagery and complex imagery, this blissful state and spiritual experience, very little anxiety. And you almost don't see the effects of harmine and placebo because they're just in the middle. And then I also show you here uh, the experience sampling we did for several keywords, but I show you here the empathogenic because that goes into the direction of uh, relationships. Um, you see that um, PharmaWasca led to an increase in empathogenic keywords, uh, such as compassion or oneness, um, and it decreased, but it still um, at 300 minutes, it was still there a little bit while harmine alone only led to a little bit of increase. That's just for a general understanding of the phenomenology. Now we did a task about effective self-other overlap, um, because it has been shown that um, the self-other overlap, emotional self-other overlap, also predicts the, the response in the, in the brain and that self-identification and empathy modulate uh, so-called error-related brain activity. Um, the general hypothesis was, or the question I posed was that uh, if placebo uh, would um, be more uh, of a differentiation between self and other, and if the DMT and harmine would lead to a closer overlap of self and other, um, in this task. So what we did, that's a bit technical, uh, we had um, two counterbalance blocks uh, that where people had to learn symbols um, for, and they got the feedback about these symbols, if it was correct or wrong, and they got um, like uh, monetary compensation for uh, <laughs> the correct and the wrong answers and they got them in one block for themselves and in other, another block for another participant. And these symbols uh, only had a probabilistic, um, like it was a probabilistic learning task where the symbols had only a percentage of chance to be correct or to be wrong. Uh, so there was uncertainty included. What we get out of this task is on a neurophysiological level, these uh, feedback-related negativities. These are uh, very preliminary results. Uh, we see some trend effects of, um, of the pharmavasca to decrease in general the FRN, and we see some trend effects also from self versus other, but this is really just a preliminary illustration of the concept we're interested in. Um, we are working on the analysis. And we also see how people learn. And we see also some trends here. If people learn for themselves in the placebo conditions, they learn better than for others. But this effect in a trend um, is smaller in the pharmavasca condition. Um, please take these results just as very preliminary. We are working on that and going to publish it hopefully in some month. Another task that we did was the karaoke task. Uh, this didn't mean that the participant had to sing during the experience, but we recorded them before the experience. And during the experience, they would hear themselves singing, or another person singing, or the original voice singing. And we actually found that the feeling of embarrassment was stronger generally for the self versus for others and it was generally lower in the 
pharmavascular condition than in the placebo condition. And we actually found this interaction effect that the embarrassment uh, reduction in the pharmavascular condition was strongest for the self. So we have this nice interaction effect of reduced embarrassment uh, under pharmavascular, which um, is closely related to self-compassion, ultimately to the relationship to oneself. One note on that side, I think it's always important to also correct or have potential confounders in mind. So we found that the objective quality under pharmavascular was evaluated uh, as better. So this could be a potential confounder that people just don't think they think awkwardly. <laughs> um, so yeah, we will also look at some physiological measures to kind of complete that picture. That was very technical. Now some more broad findings that we found uh, with uh, questionnaires. We found post-acute effects uh, in increased mindfulness, self-compassion, and compassion with others. Uh, after the pharmavasca experience, more pronounced than after the other experiences. We did not find lasting effects in terms of trade changes. And we also found that the effects um, also depended on the sensitivity to the substance. So the people that had um, more intense experiences had higher increases in these parameters. This uh, is also something that we are just wrapping up and hopefully publishing soon. Back. Oh, no. um, Something that I also find interesting is the psychological insights. Um, we often hear about mystical type experiences and spiritual experiences. Um, here we found that um, participants also reported like more these psychological insights to avoidance or maladaptive patterns that they uh, experience with themselves and also towards goals and like adaptive patterns. And these were more pronounced in the um, pharmavasca experience than in harmine and then in placebo. We also looked at some persisting effects. As I just said, uh, we have no lasting effect in these trade measures of mindfulness or compassion. But still, we had um, some persisting effects that participants reported regarding their attitude towards life. Um, and also towards themselves and also um, regarding their uh, overall altruistic and positive social effects. I think it's important to note here that this is not differentiated um, uh, between the substances because this was just uh, in the follow-up, so this includes the effects of the overall study. And of course, um, it might have also been triggered through other processes. Again, a reminder that these are numbers and correlations. And uh, as we saw with the qualitative reports of the ayahuasca survey, um, what's behind the numbers? It's experiences and people going through these experiences. Now to sum that up uh, regarding ayahuasca and analogs and relationships that we find effects of ayahuasca on relationships in everyday life. We also find some acute and post-acute effects uh, of ayahuasca analogs in the intervention study on relationship to self and others, but um, only some persisting effect. So it's not a magic pill and you will change your traits. Uh, it's not the way it works. And I think we are also aware of the importance of experiential and contextual factors modulating these experiences. Uh, also a summary uh, that we already know, this is a very complex soul journey. And from uh, the methodological issues, I want to name just a few, like uh, about the selection bias. Um, I touched upon that already uh, in the Intervention study, we have a very weird uh, sample that's uh, called for Western, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic persons, in our case, even uh, male people. So that's a very, <laughs> a very specific sample of healthy male young people. Um, 
also something regarding the ayahuasca survey that's uh, important to me to say is that there we have a more diverse population, but we still don't have data from the actual indigenous people. So it's really also about the kind of the Western, even if it's in South America with the churches, it's not uh, a study on the indigenous use of indigenous people. I think that's important to stress, and I also think that's partially because this type of research is just not the way that the world is perceived by indigenous people. So I think the work that um, we heard yesterday about the tobacco is much more appropriate to investigate this. Um, and again, publications are in preparation, so everything I talked to you is not peer-reviewed yet, uh, so take it with caution. Then another summary I would like to do, or um, yeah, to talk about is um, like more generally about doing research. I think uh, my message would be, especially for the young researchers amongst you or the people we heard that want to do uh, research, I like if we can combine observational and interventional in, uh, research, and if we also combine exploratory and confirmatory uh, analysis, qualitative and quantitative. Uh, so different methods and different angles to look at phenomena that we're interested in. And another thing that I find important is a dialogue and interdisciplinary dis discussion and dialogue and collaborations. Um, As a little bit of outlook, uh, there are other measures that we are working on now, um, also on physiological uh, levels. Then for the future, also include women, certainly. Uh, we, will, we are also planning clinical trials where we will uh, look at um, not only healthy population, but also work with patients in, um, in studies. And with that, I would like to thank the team um, uh, headed by Milan Scheidegger. Um, this is actually just a team that was involved in this um, randomized controlled trials. It has grown in the meantime uh, with uh, further studies that we're planning. Some people are sitting here, uh, so I would also like to thank these people that are not here. <laughs> um, and uh, my PhD supervisors, and also the lab that I'm coming from with Franz Vollenweider. Um, I would like to end the whole thing with yet another quote by one of the global ayahuasca uh, participants. Nothing more to say than thank you. Thank you, Elena. Now we'll have 15 minutes for questions. So if the <coughs> volunteer with the microphone can... Yeah. Yes, thank you, first of all, for this uh, wonderful and informative talk. Um, my question is twofold. Uh, one concerns the methodology. Um, you reported on what kind of measures you used uh, to... to um, uh, tease out exactly what interpersonal uh, changes there are with uh, uh, pharmawaska or ayahuasca. And I'm wondering whether you also entertain the idea of using a more, let's say, broader model of interpersonal changes, like the interpersonal circumplex model, for example, which would be interesting to see also because given the fact that uh, Timothy Leary came up with this model uh, before he even touched psychedelics in the first place. And the um, second part of the question is whether you entertain the idea of um, using or having interpersonal changes rated by significant others, um, because uh, it could also be that, uh, or a possible confounder of uh, the Mm, evaluation of changes after uh, ayahuasca is certainly also the afterglow of uh, these experiences and the hype that oneself feels about these substances after the experience. But uh, maybe it's interesting to see as uh, to how family members perceive how their family member has changed. So, 
Yeah, that's Thank a very good point. So the perception bias. Um, we did the family member or close um, other rating with uh, one of the retreat studies with psilocybin, and it's also planned for forthcoming studies. We did not have it here. And uh, regarding social interactions, um, maybe that could be something we could talk about, how to include that. Uh, we are planning also a group study where we thought or we... I uh, thought we could also include cameras and uh, doing like sociological or social dynamic um, analysis of the social interactions, which is a bit of a question if you really want to uh, film these participants, if this does not influence um, their behavior. Uh, I think we're open. Um, this was just the very first study. Uh, and certainly um, ratings of other uh, significant others. I think that's an important contribution and complementation. So maybe we can talk about it later. Um, thank you, Helena. Um, <coughs> so, <coughs> excuse me, even perhaps in 10 years uh, with this kind of uh, progress that you have exemplified, there might still be uh, no clear nosology for de selecting from among the list, the short list, let's say, of substances which to use in a particular context, social context, or uh, symptom cluster. Although I suppose it's premature, would you perhaps be able to speculate if there's any emerging sign that ayahuasca or ayahuasca analog might be particularly suitable for uh, treating particular class of patients? Mm. <clears throat> I think um, what we think about is um, like broadly depression and anxiety, as many other trials do also, and also eating disorders maybe. Um, one thing that I found particularly interesting um, about the differences between the ayahuasca and the pharmawasca that we're working on is that it's like more predictable, it's more controllable, um, it um, can like manage the dose maybe better. Um, some people that are into ayahuasca might say, well, this is ex actually the, the effect of the ayahuasca that you jump into the cold water. But I imagine for traumatized patients, for example, the pharmawasca could be an option because you can control it very well. Uh, you can modulate the, the effect quite nicely. We have uh, very little variation in terms of intensity and blood levels. So it's for traumatized participants um, or people, I would say, uh, the pharmawasca could be uh, suitable, maybe, PTSD. But we will see in studies. Um, hi, over here. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have two questions about the intervention itself. So first was how long did the experience go? Was it comparable to ayahuasca or was it rather like a psilocybin trip in the length? And then the second question was, you said that, that um, you measured the um, embarrassment. It, so were they connected to EEG during the experience or how did you measure that exactly? And did people perceive having to do questionnaires in between as somewhat disturbing maybe of their experience? Good questions. So maybe I start with the karaoke test. The embarrassment was measured with a scale, a questionnaire, um, but we also um, have cortisol blood levels that we're just analyzing now and heart rate. Um, it was a task just in the afterglow, so um, it was not too difficult for them to fill out the questionnaire. In the more peak um, states, we only had like one word uh, experience sampling, which works very well. I'm also uh, writing on something about this approach of um, capturing the dynamics. Um, regarding the duration, um, DMT has a very short um, half life. Half? Uh, how do you say? Halbert's <laughs> time. Uh, so what we did was also increasing the dose. So we uh, dosed it every 15 minutes up to 100 uh, uh, milligrams of DMT uh, plus 100 milligrams of harmine. So we did not have like uh, just one shot. Uh, with that, it would just last maybe two hours um, or three. 
Here, as um, you maybe saw on the graph with the empathogenic keywords, around 300 minutes after the first DMT administration, they were somehow back to baseline with the intensity, but like the uh, empathy and the liking that uh, went a bit longer, maybe also because of the context that they like. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I noticed on the the graph with the experiential and contextual intersubjective, um, the age of first use for the participant had a negative symbol by it. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on that and, and why that is. Thanks. Yeah, that is like with an increasing age of first use, participants um, had like... Um, it uh, kind of increased the effect of the IO, uh, it decreased the effect of the ayahuasca consumption of the relationship. So, if, um, yeah, I mean, we could look at that more in detail. That was just a finding. Uh, maybe also uh, correlated to the fact that in the churches, participants uh, start much maybe younger because as part of their family. Uh, so these are just main effects. I only showed you one interaction effect or mediation, I think. The age per se, maybe it's um, also depending on what uh, other factors influence the age when you take it the first time. I have a question regarding the long term effects. Um, how long was the longest like follow up um, comment in the global ayahuasca um, project? And it, are there any hints on other literature or global literature on whether it needs to? you know, be taken on a regular basis to um, have positive effects on, for example, mood disorders, or whether a set of um, takings uh, will have lo long-lasting effects? So you mean, uh, what was the longest distance of, uh, like, having taken ayahuasca until filling out the... Yeah. That's um, an interesting question. I didn't look at that, um, like, precisely, but I saw in some of the reports that some people wrote, oh, okay, it's just like last week was my first experience, so I'm uh, still like, I don't know how it will be in my everyday life. Um, but I didn't, or we didn't look at uh, this specifically. Um, and there are some papers that uh, talk about uh, lasting effects, at least uh, maybe one year follow-up of just one single doses of um, psilocybin, for example. But then I'm also curious about what was triggered by their experiences. So I imagine people that profit a long time just from one experience, they might have done something with the process that was triggered. Um, yeah. I have uh, two questions which are interconnected through the cultural difference issue. One is uh, the ritual context, which in the places of origin has a special form, and when I see your photographs of your lab, I miss it, of course. Would it be possible to create a more sensual ritual context here, adapted to our culture? This is one question. The second one is the one of our Western approach to finding truth, which is in, um, strongly coming from the cultural enlightenment and uh, rational way of looking at things. In other cultures, they have different ways to perceive reality and to find out what is truth. Mm -hmm. It's more broad in a way. Mm -hmm. How can you, um, do you, are there plans to respect these two uh, points, ritual context and f the pr uh, context how to approach truth? Very interesting questions. Um, like the the room that you saw uh, was a picture when we had not moved away uh, one of the uh, the cupboards. So I think people liked the generally nicely prepared room, and I mean we try to be as neutral as possible, but by, by, while still being empathogenic, and like empathy and like provide care for them. So we tried to make it comfortable and provide a nice setting, but 
as much as is ethically possible uh, remove our factor while we still are aware that this is not completely possible and participants reported that the way we took care of them was also very important for them. So this is still not a ritual setting and I think um, yeah, uh, that's very delicate also, like w what do we want to integrate, what do we want to adapt. Uh, we are just um, preparing now a study with a group setting uh, where there will more be like this group uh, experience as well. Um, yeah, I think it's a very delicate uh, situation. I mean, we don't put ourselves in any kind of uh, shamanic position or so. It's really... Um, uh, we are a team and we are there with the participants. Um, that's the way we work. And of course, there is some sort of ritual by putting flowers there, by having candles, by making it comfortable. But we try also to make it comfortable by not, <laughs> at the same time, not uh, being too much influencing, which also <laughs> is a topic of. And the second one was the. The truth. I think uh, we have these, as I said, these uh, different perspectives of gaining knowledge and uh, a scientific understanding of that. And if we see that what we find doesn't fit into our understanding or our paradigm, then this paradigm <laughs> needs to be adapted. This is also what's going on right now with the biomedical paradigm and the more psychological or contextual paradigm that we find, okay, the way that <coughs> A psychedelics work cannot be fully explained by only biomedically understanding it. And we already have paradigms from psychotherapy research where the effects uh, kind of fit in. So we need to also understand from which perspective we understand it. And we are also aware that, um, I mean, we had taken <coughs> or we had um, let participants fill out the questionnaires on a tablet. So. For example, when you have a visual analog scale, you can just put, uh, put it somewhere. But if you do it, for example, with paper pencil, we also had situations where participants would just make uh, a horizontal line. Uh, so I think this already explains that uh, you, sometimes you can't put it in words. And uh, about truth, I think we heard the talk by Peter yesterday about the metaphysicals. I can't uh, answer that like fully. So we'll have time for one last question. Uh, thank you very much. I'm an active practitioner with um, uh, ketamine in, in Johannesburg because of the prevalence of uh, trauma in, in the country. But uh, So I don't come from a research background, so I'm really curious to know what you use as a placebo because surely sugar water wouldn't do it because there'd be an expectation for some kind of uh, you know, psychedelic trip with the placebo itself. Yeah, certainly uh, we have often expectation effects. We, uh, what I find, um, not in this study, but we found it in the, in the psilocybin and meditation study that the drug-naive participants had really high levels uh, on many... Um, dimensions of the altered stage of consciousness scale just because the setting and the expectation. In our case, we had a mixture, like we did not have like psychedelic enthusiasts, <laughs> so they had uh, maximum some uh, psychedelic experiences before or even no. And um, like experientially, um, you see only very little effects of harmine and almost no effects of DMT. And we used really um, capsules, um, or like the the form of administration were, was like the same um, in for the DMT and the harmine as for the placebo. So we would always give these two compounds, but sometimes it was just uh, the placebo. So thank you so much, Elena, for this talk and answer the question. Thank you.